In this series, we're taking a look at our different generations, and we're trying to line, well, we are, we're not trying to, we are, lining these up with Sundays that make sense. So Mother's Day, we're going to talk about Ruth and Naomi and their relationship with each other, generation to generation. Next weekend, uh, we're going to take a look at Jesus and the children, and we're giving out third grade Bibles next week, next week which is a, a huge uh, land uh, mark for our children who have prepared and he prepared for next week. So I look forward to that time together. Uh, next weekend is also a very significant weekend for our family. Our sons are graduating from college. And uh, so big transition. Yeah, give them a big hand. And we'll be passing the uh, plates one more time just to finish up their tuition payments. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like uh, next year without that uh, huge sucking sound of, <laughs> out of our bank account. <clears throat> um, uh, but they graduate next week and, and have a really unique opportunity to be at two graduation ceremonies next Saturday, one at one o'clock, because uh, Brendan is getting a bachelor's of arts degree in music, and then at four o'clock, because Connor is getting a bachelor's of science in psychology. And uh, I get the privilege at the second ceremony to do the benediction. So I get to wear my my robe with my stripes and my doctoral hood look like one of those, uh, you know, academic geeks. And, um, <laughs> but I'm very, very proud of them and what they've accomplished and, and get to celebrate that together as a family next weekend. So um, another opportunity for us to think about generation to generation and, and how we prepare for the next generation, the investment we make in the next generation. And in families, that seems to make sense to us. We make investment in our children and our children's children to uh, perpetuate a legacy, to in, ensure that our family uh, line continues, prospers as best we can in our control. Uh, that seems to make sense to us in our own families. And we have our own challenges in our families and how actually to be faithful to that call to provide for the next generation. But the same is true for the church. The church, if part of who we are as a church is a family, then we hold together at least four generations at one time, and look at, look forward, look, look back to those who have come before us, and look forward to those who come behind us and say, how is it that we are passing on faith and wisdom to the next generation? How do we learn from those who have gone before us, and how do we provide for those who are coming behind us, so that we can be a part of God's faithfulness from generation to generation? Psalm 33, 11 says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm together, the purposes of his heart through all generations. And I believe that we are part of God's faithfulness in fulfilling his purposes. And so today I want to take a look at uh, the story of Ruth and Naomi. If you'll turn in your, you, I'd like you to open your pew Bible, if you don't have your own Bible with you. Uh, it's on page 241. It's just four chapters long, and if you have not read it... Um, then I encourage you to read it this afternoon or tomorrow. It's just four chapters long. It won't take you long, but you'll have a better idea putting these thoughts into context in the whole uh, book of Ruth. It's an odd book because it's one of just two that are named after women, Ruth and Esther. And it's a short book that has a story that is told of a, mother, uh, a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law and the way God binds their hearts together. Uh, by the way, if you haven't picked up a bookmark, it's right in front of you in the pews there. Pick that up. Uh, these bookmarks are intended to help us prepare for the next uh, week's message and also provide for us a pattern for uh, growing our time uh, of solitude and prayer and scripture meditation uh, during the week on our own personal, uh, personal life. Uh, I got an email, received an email this last week how someone took that bookmark seriously found a time in their morning at work before everything got crazy uh, to sit down quietly for 20 minutes and read through the scripture passages and, and just the reflection of how that changed their day, their perspective. So I encourage you to take that bookmark and use it. But this, the bookmark this, this last week prepared us to read uh, Ruth for this week. So I'm just going to read a few passages and then, and then uh, draw some points on how I believe we pass on uh, Wisdom and faith from one generation to the next through Ruth and Naomi's uh, life together. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. 
The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were uh, Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. The book of Ruth centers around the relationship between these two women who are left, Naomi and Ruth. And the first thing that we learn about their relationship and and about our intergenerational relationships is that, surprisingly, sorrow can form our deepest relationships. Surprisingly, sorrow can form our deepest relationship. Look at this first paragraph that sets up this story and look at the sorrow and pain that this family has experienced. First, it begins with famine. Now, famine uh, uh, means economic hardship. It means a loss of the ability to, uh, to earn a living. And Bethlehem was vulnerable to drought uh, because they depended on cisterns for their water. And if there was no rainfall, there was no cisterns to collect the water. They also experienced the pain and sorrow of moving. They have to move to Moab, which is, depending on where they lived, uh, between 70 and 100 miles. It would have taken them seven days to travel. Picture that. You're experiencing famine, and now you need to pick up your family and move, and it takes you a week to get to this new place you're going. Just think of that uh, for yourself personally, what that would be like. Third kind of sorrow and pain they're experiencing is death. And this really forms the basis for their relationship. Naomi lost her husband and her two sons. And Naomi lost her husband along with her sister-in-law, Orpah, in the course of 10 years. Now, what's significant about this is the plight of widows. Widows in those days to lose your husband meant that you lost all social status and without any political or economic uh, power status. They would be like homeless people in our society today. So this is really the ruin of Naomi and Ruth. They really had no one to provide for them. And this creates the pain and sorrow that becomes the basis of their relationship. Naomi expresses her pain. If you look in uh, verse 12 of chapter 1, she encourages Orpah and Ruth to go back home to go back to their gods in Moab, to their family, to their gods. And she says this, Naomi says this, Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. She's given up. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you. Because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Can you hear her pain? Her sorrow? At this they wept aloud again. This is pretty significant. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. I guess Orpah didn't like the crying and the weeping, so she, she left. But Ruth clung to Naomi. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. They arrived in Bethlehem. The whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? They recognized Naomi again. Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasantness. This is ironic. Her name means pleasantness. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Don't even call me by my name. Call me bitter because of what I've experienced. She said, I went away full. I left this place full. But the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Can you experience the depth of this pain, this grief and sorrow? Her life has been ruined. 
She recognizes her bitterness at losing her husband. And surprisingly, this is what forms the basis of her relationship with Ruth. We have two generations bound together by sorrow. This transition of moving and then moving again, of losing their husbands, this grief and loss. And the truth is, often our deepest relationships are formed through the shared experience of pain and loss. This is surprising to us. We think that our deepest relationships are formed around mutual success and joy, right? At least that's the way we would like to write the story. Two people come together and share their successes, and God binds their hearts together in sisterhood or brotherhood forever. Wouldn't that be a great way to write the story? But often, our deepest relationships are bound together by our shared sorrow and pain. And it's the deeper sorrow and pain that creates this bond between two generations that are very different from each other. Two women who have a shared experience. So just quickly, a question for us. How are you sharing your grief or sorrow with someone else? Who's the person in your life that you're able to say today, Mother's Day is really not a time for me to celebrate, it's a time for me to mourn. Who are you able to say that to today? As we're all celebrating our mothers, and I called my mom last night just to make sure I didn't forget to call her today, and Carol Ann was very uh, pleased by that. Uh, as, as much as today is a day to celebrate, today is also a time when many women grieve. Grieve the broken relationship with their mother, the loss of their mother. Grieve not being a, not being a mother. Who is the person that you're able to share deeply with? How are you sharing your loss or sorrow with others that God has placed in your life, especially those of another generation? My wife Amy lost her mom in, in 1995. Matter of fact, we were in San Diego at a, a board meeting, and we were staying at a hotel in, San, in Mission Bay when we got the phone call that Amy's mom had passed away after a total of 13 years of breast cancer that metastasized. And probably the greatest loss in Amy's life. And that's created a special sisterhood with her and other friends who have also lost their mom. There's something about a daughter losing their mother that is a very unique experience. And those relationships that Amy has formed with others who have lost their moms often becomes that that touch point, that place of sorrow becomes the place of great depth in their relationship with each other. Our common faith in Christ, in the body of Christ, our common faith in Christ gives us the ability by faith to go deeper into those conversations. We're not afraid to have conversations around sorrow or grief because we know that God goes there with us that his Holy Spirit can communicate his grace, can create a, a place of safety and, and trust where we're able to share with each other. This is true for women, and this is true for men. Maybe men have even more difficult time sharing with each other their loss and grief and sorrow. And I believe we miss out on an opportunity to go to a deeper place with one another. To trust God together in that place where we can share our pain and sorrow. This was the basis for Naomi and Ruth's relationship that contributed toward God's plans being uh, fulfilled from one generation to the next, which we'll see a little later. So today, I'd encourage you to take the risk of sharing with someone you trust what it feels like today to celebrate Mother's Day both in your joy and in your sorrow. I'd encourage you to allow room in your conversation for that today. Second thing we learn about this passage, this relationship between Ruth and Naomi, is that God calls generations to belong to each other like family. God calls generations to belong to each other like family. In the middle of, of this where, uh, uh, in, in this 
conversation in, in the first chapter, uh, Naomi says this, look, your sister-in-law is going back. She says to Ruth, pointing to Orpah, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where are you going? This is the famous passage from Ruth that is read at wedding ceremonies, that is uh, quoted in cards to each other. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. This short phrase, this short sentence from Ruth tells us that Ruth was committing herself to Naomi, her mother-in-law, not a blood relative, but by marriage, was committing herself to her emotionally. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Socially, your people will be my people. Spiritually, your God will be my God. Ruth commits herself to her and even says, I will die with you. What she means is that when, Naomi, when you die, I will be there like your daughter to care for you. I will make sure that you have the proper burial. I'll be there with you. I'll care for you like a daughter would care for her mother. I will be family to you. Ruth commits herself to Naomi rather than going back home. So who is someone, not family, that you commit yourself to, that you belong to as if you were family? This is a great challenge for us in the church today, intergenerationally. As we age, the generations get farther and farther apart. We become more and more distinct through rapid social change, through technology and world events. The church holds together four generations at least, plus our children, our youngest children. Four generations from those who were were born at the beginning of the 20th century to those who are being born today. The differences between us are so great because of our different perspectives in our generations, and yet God calls us to, be, to belong to each other from generation to generation. It's a huge challenge in the church. I don't know if you've thought of that. If you think of how different we are from each other, and yet God calls us together to fulfill his purposes. Huge challenge for the church. Maybe a challenge that is unique in all of society the challenge that the church has to hold together these four generations. You, you've probably read some about the different generations. I want you to, in your margin just to identify these four generations. The generation of the builders, those who were born between 1922 and 1934. These are those who, the builders who built our country, who fought in World War II, who built our institutions. And the boomers who were born between 1944, who are turning 60... How old are they now? 65? Right? To 1960, the year I was born. Boomers. The great baby boom, post-war, World War II baby boom. The Xers from 1961 to 1980, they were born. And the millennials who were born the next 20 years, from 1980 to 2000. And the the way we approach life and our perspectives is so different from each other. And maybe you look back and say, well, generations has always been different. But the rapid change, social change, world events, technology separates us more and more from each other. So here's the way that builders would ask a moral or ethical question. They would ask the question... Is it right? A boomer would ask the question, is it helpful? An Xer would ask the question, is it real? And a millennial would ask the question, is it sensitive? Are we taking into consideration each other's feelings? In his book, uh, Gary McIntosh's book, One Church, Four Generations, he then makes the connection to the church. Here's the questions that different generations ask when they approach the church. Here are the four questions. One, builders ask the question, am I respected here? Boomers ask the question, am I growing here? 
Xers ask the question, do I belong here? Millennials ask the question, can I make a difference here? Four very different questions as we approach the church and look for meaning and participation and connection with the church. Four different questions. Am I respected here? We have a senior population we celebrated last week who is asking the question, am I respected here? Does anybody acknowledge me for what I've done and my, my uh, wisdom and experience? Boomers, am I growing here? Am I getting anything out of this experience? Xers, do I belong here? Is there a sense of connection to each other? And millennials, can I make a difference? Where can I serve? What can we do to change the world? Church has the unique opportunity to call generations to belong to each other, which means we need to know each other. We need to have compassion on each other. We need to understand each other and not be separate from each other. Here's what Gary McIntosh says in his book. It's in the bottom of your outline. Not only are there four generations existing together, but there are four sets of value systems that are being advanced, each with its perceived needs and perspectives. When we understand each generation's values and how they were molded by events that define the generation, we can be more faithful in our use of limited resources to effectively fulfill the Great Commission. This is particularly uh, meaning, this quote is particularly meaningful to me right now because our staff and session are in the process of developing our budget with limited resources. And we're always balancing competing values and perspectives and needs within our church family. What do we provide for our youngest children? What do we provide for our most senior adults and everything in between? It's a challenge for us, and we need to be belong to each other. It requires our commitment to each other and our commitment to understanding each other. Well, in the story of Ruth and Naomi, we fast forward to the end of this story. You can read it yourself. There's a whole lot of things that happen on the, the threshing floor with, with uh, Ruth and Boaz. I'm not going to go into the detail there. But fast forward, we find Naomi's, uh, that at Naomi's encouragement, Ruth marries Boaz. This is a fulfillment of God's faithfulness both to Naomi and to Ruth. Ruth is married and has a son through her marriage to Boaz, and Naomi has security because Boaz buys her land. The third point in this story is that God blesses each generation's faithfulness to him and to each other. The very end of the story, uh, Ruth marries uh, Boaz, they have a son, and here is Naomi and Ruth and Boaz together, and the women living there said, Naomi has a son. Naomi has a son. Recognizing this is Naomi's blessing. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, here's the big surprise. Through Naomi and Ruth's commitment to each other, to their, in their, through their faithfulness to each other, God is faithful to bless each of them. Naomi gives herself, Ruth gives herself to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She commits herself to her in a family-like relationship where they belong to each other. And, her, and Ruth's needs are met through her giving herself away to Naomi. And Naomi's needs are met as she welcomes Ruth into her family. Their needs are met. They experience God's blessing. Each generation experiences God's blessing as they are faithful to God and to each other. So here's the big surprise in this story. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here's a family that almost ended. Here's a family that almost had no offspring. The generation would have been ended except for God's blessing. Right? And the surprise is that this child Obed is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. Now, if you're reading this story, years later, what would you say at that point? You're reading the story, what would you say? Somebody, what would you say? What? Wow, that's good. What else? Thank God. Thank God for Ruth. If, except for Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi, 
there would be no King David. Now, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Would you do that? Flip to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew begins the gospel by listing the genealogy of Jesus. And you have four, the three sets of 14 generations. And the first set of generations is, what, uh, is where Obed fits in. The father of Jesse is the father of David. But find that, find Jesse and David in Jesus' genealogy. Did you find it? Now, if you are a Christian, worshiping, serving the Messiah, and now you read this story, what do you say? Double wow. Because of Naomi's faithfulness and Ruth's faithfulness and God's blessing in their generation, God provided a king, David. And because of their faithfulness, God provided a Messiah in Jesus. See, we never know. We never know the blessing of future generations because of our faithfulness. We never know what God is going to do because we've chosen to belong to each other. We never know what God is going to do because we've chosen to be faithful to Him. The plans of the Lord stand firm together. The promises of His heart through all generations. We get to be a part of God's faithfulness from one generation to the next. This is a huge challenge in our own families as we think of the needs of our parents. As I think of my parents who are getting older. And I think of my sons who are getting older and their needs are changing and transitioning. It's challenging my own family to think of how I can be faithful from one generation to the next. Even more so in the family of God. For us to consider how we are called to be faithful to God's purposes through our relationships intergenerationally. On this Mother's Day, as we reflect on the generations and our gratitude for those who have been faithful uh, and have blessed our lives. I want us to consider how it is that God is calling us as a church to be connected to each other one generation to the next so that we can be part of God's purposes. I think one thing that changes our hearts more than anything else as we, uh, is, is prayer and praying for each other. And I'd like to close us by praying for different generations. And I, I want to just leave time of silence for you to picture people in your family and outside of your family who are older than you and younger than you. People that you'd want to lift up and consider what their unique sorrows are or pain is, what their challenges are, and how God might call you to form a deeper relationship with them. Let's pray together. God, you know that today families are on our hearts. Tom has prayed for families around the world, especially moms, but families and how challenging life can be uh, here in this community and around the world. We know that a great challenge for us today in our families and in the church is how we relate to each other from generation to generation, how we know each other, how we understand and have compassion and share our sorrow with one another from one generation to the next. As we think of our own families and we think of the families in this church, we want to lift up, God, our youngest children. From the Frankie's uh, son who was born to our infants and toddlers, Bring to our minds names and faces of those that we can lift up to you in prayer. We pray your blessing. And our older elementary age children and junior hires who are going through such uh, tremendous transition and change socially, intellectually, physically, We lift them up to you.
our high school students and college age students, graduate students, our 20 somethings. God, we lift them up to you. Pray for adults in our lives who are between 30 and 40 and 50. Unique challenges of career and family. As we move into boomer generation, the older end of 60-year-olds and into the builder generation of 70 and 80 year olds, our senior adults. We lift them up to you. Their unique challenges and opportunities. As I've led us in prayer during this time, there may be a particular person that God has put on your heart of all of the generations, older or younger, there's one person that God has put on your heart. Their faces come into your mind. Lift that person up to the Lord and ask him how you might deepen your relationship with that person. And God, we pray for our whole church family that as we move forward as a growing community of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, that you'd give us wisdom and discernment to know how you're calling us as a whole church to move forward together into the purposes and plans that you have for us. Give us compassion for each other and understanding as we build deeper relationships with one another and fulfill your purposes so that you might be glorified throughout the whole world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God has been our dwelling place for, for all of eternity, past. God will be our dwelling place. He will be our shelter, our home. Today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, I pray that we would recognize God's faithfulness to those that we belong to in the church and in our families. Let's now go with the blessing of God the Father Almighty who created each one of us in love that our lives would be for the praise of his glory and the blessing of his son Jesus who died for each one of us who is a fulfillment of God's perfect plan. The blessing of God the Holy Spirit who goes with us to those places of pain and sorrow as well as those places of joy and celebration so that we together might be for the praise of his glory now and forever. Amen? Amen. Amen.